There's something that is really axiomatic for me. Pretty much all human beings need to feel that they are living their lives. They're calling the shots. Not entirely. We can't ever realistically expect to determine our destinies. We have to compromise because other people are determining their destinies too. So we've got to allow for that. We've got to adjust our determinations to their determinations. But a human being simply cannot live in passivity, simply, as it were, living a life according to somebody else's lights, directives, or determinations. It seems that one of the most critical things wherever you find relations of domination or inequality is that the insufferability of that situation for the person who is the underling is that they have been robbed of the power to choose. In a situation of inequality, the situation of disadvantage is characterized not by what you lack in wealth or what you lack in political power. It's characterized mainly by the fact of what you lack existentially, namely the right to choose, the right to direct or determine things yourself. This is systematically underestimated wherever you have an enterprise which is carried out in the name of bringing enlightenment or bringing liberation to another people. You can bring great good to a people, but unless they have invited you or chosen to have the great good brought to them, the wealth, the advantages which you see for them are countermanded by the fact that they are being placed in the situation of being passive recipients. Unless a person wants to change, they can't be changed. They will resist. Even though your change is motivated by compassion for that person who is suffering and is informed by a knowledge of how that person's life can be improved. So this is basic, the need for people to have their kind of will to determine things respected. Well, I do ethnography, which is a method of getting an understanding of other people by going and living with them and talking to them on their own terms and their time. And that means the suspension of your own prejudices and your own kind of worldview as much as possible even though you may not believe what they believe or can embrace their ethical propositions, you at least set aside your own in order to get a better understanding of them. And I think that's a good way to kind of live, and, and it's also absolutely essential to coming to terms with how other people see the world. Unless one is capable of being open to other realities and seeing other people on their terms, you can't, I think, really claim to know yourself. You've got to test yourself and your reality against the realities of others. And you can only do that in conversation. I was in Africa in 64, when I was 24, doing community development work attached to the United Nations, though I was a voluntary worker. And uh, I discovered the, uh, the sheer excitement of being in Africa but working to change people's lives was not enabling me to kind of engage in the lives which I was purporting to change. I was somebody who was imposing his will on Africa, an Africa that I had never taken time to understand. At the time, I simply wanted to know the people that everybody in the United Nations was supposing to be in need of our help. So it was very much like the old colonial idea of the civilizing mission. You know, these people were, it was assumed, wanting education, needing education, needing health care, needing development, without asking them if that's what was most important to them. One has learned over the years, and there's some very, very, very good documentations of this, that if you consider all the aid and development that has been poured into Africa or imposed upon Africa by the West, the negative repercussions outweigh the positive repercussions. It's partly because we're often uh, trying to impose our will on people who know what they're doing, like African farmers know the best way to farm. They've spent hundreds of years kind of evolving the best techniques for farming under the conditions they have. So for somebody to sort of blunder in and simply assume that they should change their farming techniques can have disastrous consequences. 
so I, I, I got out of that business, studied anthropology, and went back to Africa, this time not in order to bring anything to them, but to kind of learn from them. I kind of decided I would drop that presumption of knowing what Africa needed and go and live in Africa, in village Africa, and find out what people themselves felt was necessary to them. Quite often, people are prepared to live with what for us would be unacceptable hardship, high mortality rates and illness, because these are, in a sense, not the highest priority for them. Now for me, you know, as a Westerner with deeply ingrained ideas about, you know, what is most important, I naturally want to impose my values on them. But I'm far more inclined, the older I get, to allow people to decide for themselves. Even though, from a Western standpoint, it may appear that they're deciding badly that they're compromising the lives of their children in the food they're given to eat or the water they're given to drink or in the negligence when they get sick. It's a hard call because, you know, if we, if we see people making what we think of as bad decisions, are we entitled to step in and take ownership of their life uh, until they are capable of making better decisions, interest uh, decisions which are, you know, more conducive to their enjoying life or being alive. This is a very, very hard step to take. And I tend to be side with the Hippocratic sort of principle of doing the least harm, which often means um, not acting where other people would rush in and, and immediately act. Well, the question that occurs to me whenever people speak of saving a place or a people is, for who? Saving them for who? There's always an ulterior motive, there's always a hidden agenda, and we've got to bear this in mind, that for every humanitarian sort of gesture, there is a kind of hidden political sort of agenda, which may have nothing to do with humanitarian interests. It just means, it may mean that, you know, we're prepared to sacrifice tens of thousands of human lives, not uh, in the way that they're presently being sacrificed, but uh, in ways that are better serving our interests. So I'm always very skeptical of these interventions, much as one is compelled to intervene, because one cannot stand by and see human beings kind of killed in, in, in this way. Well, one thing I do know, and this is the kind of wisdom of experience, I guess, that you can't generalize. You can't sort of have a map that is going to kind of guide your moral action. A lot of human action is extremely messy and uh, unpredictable and inexplicable. And so I don't set much store by understanding through some kind of systematic uh, pre-understanding that is going to somehow hold good more or less in every situation we encounter. You've got to take each case on its own merits, and that means kind of engaging in understanding what is going on in that particular situation. You've got to yield to understanding it. In real-life situations, you know, principles and, and guidelines tend to sort of go by the board, and they are reintroduced into our thinking after the fact when we try to explain retrospectively what's happened or provide a moral sort of excuse or justification for what we've done. But I don't see them the motivating our action. Well, there's plenty of people written sort of authoritatively about that, but it, it, again, it interests me less in discovering the kind of the cause that determines a course of action, that explains uh, the, the genesis of a war, than actually seeing what the consequences of a war are, trying to see its impact on human lives. So I've kind of basically shelved or set aside the whole enterprise of trying to explain the war or explain anything and try to just enter into the lives of people who are living at a particular period of history, whether it's a period of warfare or peace, and seeing what their lives are like, what for them is the most important thing in life, what are the difficulties they experience in making a life and sustaining a life. So it's a very, very different enterprise, which is not very satisfying for people who want explanations. 
I don't buy the argument that we can actually change history by understanding it. I don't see any evidence that that has ever occurred, and I don't have any expectation that it will ever happen. Simply because we're blind to what is happening until it's too late. We understand in retrospect. We're very, very handicapped in our ability to understand things in prospect. I think human beings, by and large, intellectually at least, live backwards. And then in other respects, they live forward. But as they move forward, they stumble. They're not capable of the kind of prescience that I think we have been encouraged to believe we can possess to the extent that we can shape the future. It seems to be a fatalism that I'm espousing, <laughs> but I don't want to sort of turn it into an ism. I, I just want to say that for me, I'm much more concerned with putting my time and energies as a writer into documenting and describing the way people are living their lives under the circumstances they find than either trying to change those situations or understand them. As a kind of activist, I consider my capacity very limited, but I can make a difference to the lives of the people I know intimately, who are in a sense family or extended family for me but I would never pretend to be able to go beyond that small circle where I basically am a resourceful older person with certain kind of means at my disposal to make a small difference to people and try to sort of claim to have some understanding of how the country might be governed or how, you know, three million people's lives might be better organized. Sierra Leone is still the poorest country in the world, so that means almost zero job opportunities for young people. Whereas a lot of young women get pregnant outside wedlock and have babies to look after from quite a, a young age, young men um, are idle and looking for opportunities of something to do, of money to be earned, of a life to be led, of something to kind of give you some kind of point, purpose or hope. If one can, one will get out of the village and go to the cities of the country, but there's nothing there by and large. So you then look further afield and many Sierra Leoneans have found their way to England. They all say that life in London is terribly, terribly difficult. You're up against everything from racial prejudice to police looking for illegal immigrants to a bureaucratic way of organizing social life that absolutely defeats one's attempts to get anywhere or do anything. And all the time sort of repining for home because you're living in an environment which is you know, beyond your capacity to feel that you have any real active part in shaping it or belonging in it. But, by and large, people will say it's better to be struggling for a life here than it would be back home. It's a kind of choice between Scylla and Charybdis, the two whirlpools, the great whirlpools in the Straits of Messina that Odysseus had to steer a course between. If you veered off course either way, you'd be swallowed up and lost. But uh, you know, one might be uh, a, better, uh, a better loss than the other. Recently in Sierra Leone, in the post-war period, the West has wanted Sierra Leone to go through a truth and reconciliation process, largely like the one in South Africa and Rwanda. Most Sierra Leoneans were against this. They had their own ways of handling the post-war, the traumas of the war. And uh, in Sierra Leone, I was hearing many, many people saying to stand up in a public place and, and tell the stories of what happened is only going to open up old wounds. It's going to be hurtful to us. It's not going to help us coexist with these people that did us harm because we have to live with them now. So we choose silence. We choose to just leave that as water under the bridge, something that is in the past, and devote all our energies to kind of a new life. And for that, we need a little help, but not as you telling us that we've got to go through this truth and reconciliation process or that we are so traumatized we need some kind of rehabilitation psychologically. So what you see is still unfortunately a lot of evidence that we're not sensitive to or responsive to how people in Africa are making their lives and the values and priorities they have. Well, the first thing that occurs to me, the function of a human is to breathe and, uh, and to sleep and to eat. 
and to find companionship with other human beings and, um, and to take delight in, in being alive. I think we're social animals, it's why I'm, why I'm an anthropologist, I just see things that way. The idea that our existence can be uh, born or um, understood um, or lived in solitude is just uh, crazy to me. I think that we are who we are through the relationships we enter into and we are shaped by relationships and changed by relationships and our life is relational. There's no, no doubt about that in my mind. Well, the function of civilization has been a very uncivilized assault on, on peoples who are considered to be outside the civilized world, barbarians and savages. Civilization is, is, a, is a word with very, very unhappy resonances for me because it conveys to me the pretension and the illusion that one group of human beings or one human culture or one moment in history is superior by definition from others and this entitles those people to impose their will on others. Well, I think again, something that anthropology teaches us is that mutual interest is built into social being. Being social means it is in our best interests to give to others in order to receive from others, so that when we are indisposed or when we're hungry or when we're disabled, others will offer the compensations. Social life is based upon giving, not just receiving. So you can't really make a distinction between self-interest and mutual interest. Self-interest is to be mutually interested, and mutual interest is self-interest. Well, if one thinks of colonialism in, in various forms of imperialism, the interest of the dominant group is served by what is understood to be a kind of contractual relationship. We will bring civilization to you in the form of reading and writing or an enlightened religion or modern science if you, as it were, accept our domination and provide labor for our enterprises and allow us to exploit the raw materials under your feet. So in a sense, there is the assumption of mutual interest, but it is a mutual interest which is not contracted through conversation and dialogue. It is imposed, but there is the pretension of it. And every kind of project of domination is justified, usually, by the assumption that this is going to be mutually beneficial. Of course, you can't really speak of true mutual interest unless you have two parties negotiating a contract on an equal playing field. Well, like most human beings, one never has enough of it, no matter how much you are objectively earning. Um, I wouldn't say that money is the root of all evil, but I, I would definitely say that money isn't the source of human happiness. I've paid a certain price for leading the life I've, I've led. I've never had a significant research grant, so most of my field work in Africa, my research in Africa, was, uh, was based on uh, uh, second mortgages and, uh, and, and selling, uh, selling cars and, uh, and, uh, and basically sort of making myself poor. Me, I can, I can, I can live without very much in the, in the way of material possessions. that everybody in a certain place shares pretty much identical assumptions about the nature of the world. This is just not true. There's such extraordinary variety. There's no way in which you can kind of say, here's a boundary in which this particular worldview no longer holds true, another one begins. There is simply um, a set of variations which is continuous basically across the entire spectrum of humankind. We've got to learn to kind of 
see the variations within a culture and between cultures, but the variations within are greater than the variations between. That's my experience. I basically have learned to see another world through the individuals that I have made friendships with and not see that world as all of a piece. And this interests me a great deal. I mean, it's just not that individuals are variations on a theme that runs through all their lives. I think that um, individuals realize potentialities in the way we can be human in different ways and to different extents, and that you will find pretty much, you know, in a single sort of uh, social, social milieu, examples of every kind of sort of human possibility. Uh, more life, <laughs> more newness. The world is full of newness. It's, it's always changing by, by introducing something new. There's always a new day dawning, there's always a new beginning, there's always some new outcome from even kind of old uh, habits, old routines that sustains the sense for me that, of, of life as a, as a kind of a great place to be. I have no hope for the world. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and that's not to say that I think it's a hopeless case. I simply don't, I don't sort of uh, apply the, uh, the kind of uh, reflections that, that I apply to my own life, to the world, because that would seem to be unreasonable to, to kind of embrace something as massive as that. I don't think the world is thinkable. I, I bite off only what I can chew. I think experience comes to you if you're open to it. You don't have to lust after it or, or thirst for it. In fact, people that crave it are often the people that don't get it. I mean, it's this old idea that uh, one shouldn't be too mindful of what you require. You should be simply open all the time to what is finding you or there to be found by you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very keen on, curiously enough, a, a fairly passive way of life. That's why I say when I go to a new place, it's, um, you, you come to understand it by making yourself passive in it. Um, very much like a child learns th through being passive, by taking things in without thinking too much. They, they take things in and then one day they find they can talk. All the, the speech they've heard is converted into an ability to speak. All the, uh, the values they've learned through observation are now their values without any thinking about it. So I think that, you know, it's, it's a good thing to always live like a child, making oneself, as it were, susceptible to, uh, to being influenced, to being kind of molded, uh, to, um, to receiving understanding. The nightmare was of a, of a dark force coming from the sea, usually, and engulfing me on a beach, and then dragging me off the beach toward the sea. And I would cling to stones and, and, and everything I could to resist this force. After feeling that I was at the mercy of the nightmares for quite a long time, I decided one night that this was totally insufferable. So if I had a nightmare this particular night that I was heading into, I would allow myself to be, as it were, overwhelmed by these dark forces which were kind of threatening me, because what could be worse than having this nightmare time and time again? No, 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 I, I, before I went to sleep, I, I gave myself instructions, as it were. I said, tonight, I'm going to some, somehow give myself over to the dark force. Uh -huh. I'm going to let it take me. Yes. I don't care. <laughs> as a seven-year-old? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I figured this out, but it worked. And that was the end of the nightmares. It was a way in which I had somehow immunized myself. I mean, just like, you know, you give, uh, give people small doses of a virus or a bacteria so that the body can kind of build a defense against it. I think that this was a very similar thing that I hit upon, that, you know, by kind of, in a sense, inviting the terror into my system, my system could meet it.
but it couldn't meet it if there was a total resistance, if I was going around in a state of kind of dread, trying to kind of fend it off. You have to kind of enter into it. You have to allow it to kind of enter your system. You have to embrace it. Today, as many people say, we're living in, in a state of dread, uh, political dread of, of terror attack, of, uh, of, uh, of plague of one kind or another, either dispatched by terrorists or, or otherwise. And, 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 and people, in a sense, are making their lives miserable because of the nightmares they, uh, they are now plagued by. And there may be some kind of point in, in learning to kind of immunize oneself from these nightmares by entering into a relationship to the thing you fear. And this will often kind of have the effect of discovering that the thing you fear either doesn't exist or doesn't exist in the form you thought it existed in, or as, as it were, um, exists but isn't primarily interested in you. <laughs>